Good afternoon and welcome to this, our second uh, Defence Battle Lab webinar. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Nimbus 90 is the community for disruptive business and technology leaders. Our community includes tech experts as well as generalists who have a responsibility for, or sometimes just a professional curiosity about, the opportunities presented by innovation and technology. We do this through a range of activities from summits, masterclasses, topic focused business briefings, working breakfasts, dinners, and at the moment, lots of virtual events. Our strength is our diversity and depth, with our membership coming from the full range of sectors and industries and job titles. Our member driven activities enable the sharing of experiences and perspectives across sectors to forge relationships with peers. And our defence sub community is our latest sub community for which we're providing a range of activities to enable our defence members to network with and learn from peers and thought leaders, both inside and outside of defence. So thank you for joining us here this afternoon for our next update on the Battle Lab. We have an exciting lineup of speakers from across defence joining us this afternoon. In the interest of time, I won't give you their full bios, which you can read on the event page on our website, but open in the afternoon, uh, to update us on the vision, intent and progress of the Battle Lab and give us an update from an army perspective. We're going to have Brigadier Matt Cansdale, MBE, Head of Future Force Development in the Capability Directorate at Army Headquarters. He will then hand over to James Gavin, the Head of Future Capability Group at Defence Equipment and Support, or DE&S, to discuss the Expeditionary Robotics Centre of Excellence. Then we will have Colonel Tom Ryle, MBE, Head of Nemesis, my Navy Battle Lab, to tell us about the Navy's innovation strategy and Nemesis. He will then hand over to Dr. Matt Brooks from the Defence Science and Technology Laboratories, Counterterrorism and Security Division, who is also the Defence Battle Lab lead there. And then we'll hear from John Selgren, Head of Place at Dorset Council, to tell us about opportunities for businesses at the Defence Innovation Park and the Defence Battle Lab specifically. That should take us till 3.15, at which point we'll then move on to the Q&A part of the afternoon. So please pose any questions that you have um, whilst the speakers are presenting using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. We'll then get through as many questions as we have time for before concluding at 3.30. And with almost 200 of you online this afternoon, we won't have time to answer all your questions, but any questions that we don't have time to get to uh, will be shared with the panellists and then responses from the panel will be included in the next Battle Lab newsletter. Please note that pre-prepared remarks are on the record and are attributable to both the speaker and the event, whilst the Q&A will be off the record. And so now, without any further delay, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to Brigadier Matt Camstell. Over to you. No, th thanks, Richard. Uh, always frightened when I hear this bit's going to be on the record, especially uh, as I've tried to put in a bit of light humour, so please don't quote my jokes. Um, so thank you, uh, Richard, for that introduction. But, um, but my real thanks goes to you who've joined us on this webinar today for your engagement, for your interest in this, in this exciting venture uh, and your enthusiasm. Because somewhat evidently, uh, self-evidently, a programme or a project, a venture like this, designed to enable closer collaborative work between defence and industry would be nothing without you. Uh, and I have to say, we've, we've been really delighted with the level of interest and uh, for all the great ideas that have been coming forward. Uh, bear in mind, we haven't even uh, hit full operating capability at the moment. Today, you're gonna hear from a small selection of the defence and council representatives from across the broad body of interest and investment in this venture. We'll provide a brief update on how the project is progress progressing and some of the exciting plans but it is not meant to be one-way traffic. As I said, uh, that would sort of go against the whole spirit of the Battle Lab. And we really welcome your thoughts and views as they're hugely valuable to us as we build what this is gonna look like. Now, the last time we met in this forum was about six months ago. Uh, and if we cast our minds back, the country was about to go into a second period of lo COVID lockdown uh, and defense was on the cusp of receiving a multi-year financial settlement. Much has changed in the world in that time, uh, in the time since then. And I'm sure we're all pleased to be uh, on the path, we hope, out of lockdown. Well, six months ago, the Battle Lab existed in our minds and on sheets of paper, or perhaps uh, these days, I should say, in sort of digital form only. And again, much has changed uh, for the Battle Lab since then. The first building is now complete, and the second, the office accommodation building, is taking form, is, uh, is growing from the ground up. And exciting plans uh, and projects are taking shape. Overall, I'm delighted to be able to report that the vision 
physical infrastructure and network are coming together. But in a sense, uh, this really is only just getting started. To misquote Churchill, we're only now perhaps nearing the end of the beginning. Across defence, the last six months has seen the issuing of both the integrated review and in a command paper. In both these documents, there's clear direction to defence to do things differently and to do different things. And at the heart of it is a renewed relationship with industry and a commitment in policy and financial terms to further invest in innovation, research and experimentation, more on which later than the financial element, and to ensure that we can rapidly incorporate ideas and technology to improve capability. This, of course, is music to our ears, and I know it will be to yours, because the Battle Lab was established for exactly these reasons, and it enables a step in that direction. But there is much, much more to do. We don't know exactly what that journey will be. The notion of a partnership and collaborative development makes attempting to dictate the future futile and counterproductive, I sense. But we are putting the foundations in place upon which we can collectively build. And at this stage, I do ask you join us as you are doing on this stimulating journey as we understand how best to approach this in the future. The Battle Lab will offer the Army and other defence users, and indeed wider, its first dedicated innovation, experimentation and exploitation centre. An open invitation, uh, innovation and collaborative environment, both physical and virtual, where tactics and technology combine to drive operational advantage, now and for the future. The Battle Lab will be trusted to solve people, process and technology challenges throughout the organisation at a pace that is relevant. A couple of points I'd uh, highlight uh, at this point, and the, 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 they're the three points on the left-hand side here. The, firstly, the challenge-centric uh, end-user obsessed. This is linking the end-user with, with industry, with those who actually deliver, focused on key challenges, as this, which is central to this project. Secondly, configured to enable end-to-end -end innovation and exploitation. We have a vibrant network across defence and the defence industrial community. And what I'm seeking the Battle Lab to provide is a physical and metaphorical beacon for joining the dots and ensuring the spread of best practice and the osmosis of ideas. And finally, strategically aligned and networked. As this project comes alive and closer to fruition, more and more of our defence partners are joining us. Some of them are talking here today, but there are many more in the pipeline that are joining this initiative. And as I said earlier, while the nature of this webinar is a bit us telling you, we look forward to your comments, ideas and feedback as we grow the ideas and the venture. So the Battle Lab is positioned to benefit from access to an array of training environments and connections to extant infrastructure. Next door to the Lulworth Training Estate, which is being upgraded to increase its utility, there is clear day space to 10,000 foot and access to the sea and little, literal training environments. Just down the road from the Army Trials and Development Units, and the Land System Reference Centre, and up the road from wider defence locations, it is well positioned to tap into the wider defence ecosystem. Add to this the proactive Dorset Council and Dorset Local Enterprise Partnership, and this is the ideal site to co-locate with industry, allow for genuine trial and experimentation to happen at pace. Now, last time we met, uh, we hadn't even broken ground on the site uh, down uh, on, uh, on the ground at Winfrith. And with the, even with the inevitable frictions provided by COVID, I'm delighted to be able to report that there has been a transformation from empty building plot to first building complete within the last four months. And the photos on the slide now take you through a bit of that journey to prove that it does actually exist. As a reminder, this first building is designed as a flexible space, offering 450 square metres of offices, workshop facilities and storage space. It has Wi-Fi and 5G working now and is indeed in use now. In fact, one of our presenters uh, today is down there at the moment uh, and we are definitely fingers crossed that we want to get off to a good start and not have a technical glitch on our first public exposure of the site and that his Wi-Fi connection proves uh, to be strong and reliable. I'm sure it, I'm sure it will be uh, as we get down to that part of it. The second building uh, is taking shape. Uh, much of the sort of foundations are in and much of the first floor is already in position. Um, and it's due to be complete in late October. This facility will include 1,100 uh, square metres of office space, 150 desk spaces, and numerous collaboration areas, including conference facilities and meeting rooms. And we already have conferences planned to take place there in the second week of, of November. 
Now that might be slightly bold, but I'm, we're keeping the pressure down on the buildings on the builders uh, to make sure that it's completed exactly on time, as we have some very senior uh, and very important guests and, uh, and events planned uh, for no November. So the Defence Battle Lab and the Army Battle Lab is listed as a co-creation space as part of STICS, the National Security, Technology and Innovation Exchange. So NSTIX is a science, technology and innovation partnership across government departments and agencies designed to cohere and enable effective delivery of national security S&T outcomes through a coordinated approach to invest into investment activity. Bit of a mouthful, but luckily it's up on the screen as well. So it's there to enable a world leading, agile and responsive national science and technology ecosystem to amplify UK strengths and deliver advantage. Well, I think it should be obvious how the Battle Lab fits into this process. The services that the Battle Lab offers are being expanded now. As I said, we already have 5G within building one, and there is a project underway to provide 5G access across the Lulworth training estate. This will be the first place in the UK with this capability. Further developments will be incorporated as the project matures. Today, as I said, you're hearing from a few of the wider defence organisations involved in the project. We're really pleased that there's significant interest from across government uh, beyond defence, and we'll keep you updated as to what this looks like uh, when we fully open the centre uh, in November. Uh, just in case there's any doubt, her name is actually Alexa. We haven't got it running off, uh, uh, off an Alexa system, um, uh, just, to be, just to be clear. So I just thought I'd take a couple of minutes now to put some meat on the bones of the Battle Lab, a vision, if you will, of what a, a week in the life of the Battle Lab could look like. Firstly, we're establishing a Battle Lab board, uh, although without Sarah Meadham, unfortunately, uh, to both to manage our interest in the facility and also keep the project honest in its raison d'etre of being a facility that allows us to work collaboratively with industry. It will include representatives of all those defence users who have invested in the project and will offer a coordination and collaboration function. It will also be a useful source of information for what we can and should be doing better, allowing us to highlight those rules and governance that restrict us on this project and begin to tackle them so that we are able to more rapidly uh, generate capability. The type of activities that you might see in the Battle Lab can be bucketed into four main areas. Currently, these are both planned and aspirational, but as the team comes together and we reach our key dates in November, you'll see more and more of this coming online. As the sort of daily grind, if you will, of the Battle Lab, uh, is it going to enable users across defence that need to engage with industry to, to co-locate, be it with desk space, collaboration areas or conference facilities. And this includes the flexibility offered by the large workshop. Outreach and industry engagement is perhaps where industry will gain most benefit from this facility, be it our planned quarterly drag and den sessions, where we either we listen to what you industry have in the way of good ideas, or indeed where we tell you where our gaps and areas of need may be, all the way to focused industry showcases. These showcases will see the Battle Lab invite industry uh, representatives to come and brief on a variety of end users, to brief a variety of end users from across the fence, and so create a more formal, perhaps, uh, engagement uh, facility from the daily routine business. Additionally, I believe that industry will benefit from a more joined up approach across the MOD, be it the PAN MOD users on site being much closer together, or indeed the planned projects and focus teams that will work from the Battle Lab. I strongly believe that industry will benefit from a more united and collaborative MOD community too. And that is why, as a start of a 10, we have generated and we're supporting the setting up of the Expeditionary Centre of Expertise, uh, which we'll cover a bit more of in a moment. So this show, slide shows some of the detail of how the Army is investing in innovation, research and experimentation. As you can see, there are significant increases in budgets this financial year and planned for the future. And I, th and I think this is a genuine demonstration of our intent and commitment uh, to this development. The money isn't everything, of course, and that is why the Battle Lab and streamlining processes and working in new ways with industry is so important. Many of you will, I hope, have already heard of Ariel, the Army's innovation team. It provides a wraparound to ideas and opportunities, supports projects through funding and testing. Now, Ariel already supports over 60 projects ranging from genuinely new and novel, uh, which could be game changing all the way through to supporting projects that just need a bit of understanding uh, of the defence ecosystem. This year, we have significantly increased funding for Ariel, going from a basic funding line of 4 million to 25 million in year. 
And this money will also be used to leverage and access wider defence innovation funding uh, as and when it comes online. I'm also pleased to announce that later this year we'll be introducing an innovation loan scheme. And this initiative, which is funded by DASA, Defence and Security Accelerator, and the Army, aims to support small and medium enterprises as they enter the defence and security ecosystem. And finally, the Army's R&E activity, already due to receive about £80 million this year, is being uplifted by a further £45 million. To give an image of what the Battle Lab activity could look like, I want to introduce you briefly to Project Rufus. Now, Adam, who is sat with me here, is very proud of naming uh, Project Rufus after a hummingbird known for its extraordinary flight skills. Uh, I did Google it and discovered that it is also a diagnostic colour for urine that was used in the 1500s, but that is certainly not uh, what drew the name uh, Rufus for this project. It's definitely about the hummingbird. Now, Rufus seeks to test and improve the connection between end users and industry to understand how we can best articulate requirements and how industry can best interpret them and have the flexibility to adapt at pace. We've chosen a variety of use cases, most operational, but we all really want to see how flexible we can be and how we can test the governance wrap to deliver cutting edge uh, micro UAS capability in the hands of end users, whilst allowing industry to iterate and improve in line with end user feedback. So this, if you like, is a is a pipe cleaner and demonstration of, of what we really want to achieve, of how we express requirements, how we can work collaboratively with industry and rapidly deliver uh, to soldiers on the front line. My final point then, I mentioned briefly earlier that uh, one of our exciting early ventures within the Battle Lab is the establishment of the Expeditionary Robotics Centre of Expertise in collaboration with the Future Capabilities Group at the Defence Equipment and Support Organisation. Now, to give a little bit more detail on that centre of excellence, ex centre expertise, it's my pleasure now to hand over to James Gavin, who leads the Future Capabilities Group, to provide some more detail. James. Um, so we just wanted to spend a couple of minutes um, giving you a brief introduction uh, uh, to the uh, centre of expertise that we're standing up on ex-missionary uh, robotics. Um, when I first joined the, the FCG about five months ago now, it was very apparent to me that we had a number of different projects uh, and programmes um, you know, and a growing number of um, SQUEP, to be qualified, equipped personnel who are learning about how to explore and to take capability for the Army and other land users towards exploit. And so what we decided to do jointly with the Army is set up this centre of expertise. It's very much got a focus, not on the low TRL levels, although we are going to be carrying on working with uh, our really good partners in DSDL, DASA, an aerial who to be frank have set us up to be in this position to start saying that we want to accelerate this technology most of the projects we have started in those uh, in those areas um, in those low trl levels but as you know when we go through towards sort of tier level six seven eight nine uh, into operations we have to start thinking about the people and the processes those usual sort of valley of death blockers uh, that can prevent us from moving to operations swiftly so we've, we've created a center of expertise to work collaboratively with a number of stakeholders, industry, academia, uh, government against those existing projects, uh, but also uh, new money as well coming in there. And we very much want to have this whole uh, area working more agile by default. So we are going to be thinking about how we can more rapidly and agilely task um, external teammates to, to work with us in these areas. So we're very much about, as a slide to say, about exploring, not about experimenting, and then exploiting technology. Uh, UGVs, UAS, uh, nano UAS particularly, uh, are a big focus, along with uh, remotely piloted vehicles as well. And it's uh, very much so we can explore that disruptive technology and integrate that into you know, full battle winning technologies and capabilities. Um, it's very much about us being more efficient and effective so we can then get those cost savings about grouping these project and programs together back to be frank into industry so you can deliver more of that capability into the MOD. But it's very much as well about growing teams so we can grow that, that, that SQUEP as I said, so we can then transition to larger sort of scale capability acquisitions um, as we head towards the end of that AWE cycle that Brigadier Matt has previously briefed on. Agile by default, you'll see I've put on there. It's not agile full stop because some things don't necessarily need, need that agile view, view, but agile by default in terms of the way we're working, really putting the user at the core. So the user say, as a user, I want to be able to do whatever they want to do. And then more quickly 
improving that capability with, with Agile. Some of you will already be aware of um, uh, uh, acquisition techniques like buy and trial at scale. We want to progress that to buy and try at scale and operate uh, as well. Um, so, so that's a sort of a, a brief run through uh, the, the, the overall concept. If you want to hear more on that concept, uh, on Tuesday via the Tech UK Defence Programme, we'll be giving an hour's briefing on uh, a number of different FTG programmes, including this, and with the timescales of where we'll be going to uh, market as, as well that we're briefing there. So the reason why we're in the Battle Lab is because, uh, you know, for me, innovation is about novel ideas and technology getting into use. Um, and as some famous innovator said something like, if you want to um, innovate, get out of the office. And what, the, what they really meant was, you know, get out there and collaborate with other people. So for me, let's turn that on, on its head a bit. Let's say if you want to innovate, collaborate in the battle lab. And so this space is not just a building, it's not just a space, it's about a concept. So for my team, um, the, the battle lab is going to be who are working this expedition robotics space, it's going to become their second home, although I'm sure they'd probably throw it be their first home. Um, but, you know, it's very much about bringing other people into those environments so we can more rapidly get that user feedback to change and improve that capability and explore through the people elements, and the process elements as well. So um, that's pretty much all I've got to say today. Uh, do, do go to the Tech UK website and have a look uh, when we're talking on Tuesday uh, next week, and we'll tell you a little bit more uh, about um, the routes to market and how we'll be advertising that, obviously, through the, the funded work, through the uh, Defence Portal, uh, and we're going to constantly try and try and get that information out to you via the likes of Team Defence Information and the uh, Tech UK, as well as those more traditional routes. Uh, so so that's, that's my spiel done, Matt. Uh, back over to you. Hey, thanks, James. That, that's great. And um, I have to say, we're really excited about our partnership with, uh, with FCG uh, in this as, as we look to develop that future. So uh, I won't take up much more of your time, only to say we're really excited about this novel and new project. It's new for us uh, in many ways, working across defence, across government, with councils, uh, across industry. Uh, and it's really exciting journey that, that we want to take uh, with you as we go through. Um, I've said a couple of times that we uh, want to hear from you. And on the, on the last slide, you'll see both uh, council contacts and John Selgren will cover a bit more of that in a bit. Uh, but also uh, the contact into the army with the QR code as well. And so we look forward to hearing with you and taking that forward. And if no uh, better demonstration of, of collaborative working across defence uh, was possible than for me now to hand over uh, to Tom Ryle from uh, the Royal Navy, who's recently come on board, delighted to have him on board now run, running uh, Nemesis, the Navy's uh, innovation centre, uh, and heavily involved in the battle lab. Uh, it's great to have him with us, Tom. Brilliant. Uh, many thanks and good afternoon, everyone. So absolutely, as Brigadier Matt said, although I'm new in post with only six days under my belt as the head of Nemesis in the Navy, I come at this problem set as a practitioner and operator and primarily driven by output and effect. It's with that mindset that I'm approaching the battle lab. We're already in a state of constant competition and we must evolve our processes to ensure progress is made at a rate that gives us the advantage and a competitive edge. I'm very fortunate to have worked in some excellent joint inter-service and international teams throughout my career. And it's that collaborative approach I am seeking to instill in both the Navy's and Defence's contribution to the Battle Lab through collaboration across commands, across cap badges, across industry and across enablers. So if we start at the top, uh, and Brigadier Matt touched on it, but look at our strategic drivers from the recent integrated review. There is a shift to the principles of the integrated operating concept the continuum from operate to warfight, and the Navy is evolving from a force primarily designed for contingency to one that is also designed for permanent and persistent engagement worldwide. There is greater integration, both across domains, across government and internationally, and there's specifically pertinent, I think, for the Battle Lab, the rapid technological innovation will be the driver of modernization. We need to build stronger relationships with industry and develop new ways of partnering to ensure that pioneering research and development is pulled through to capability delivery. Delivery, excuse me. So who am I representing sat here in front of you today? Well, the Royal Navy is a 7 billion, 35,000 employee business as a bottom line up front. As with all elements of defense, we're no fail, uh, 24 seven 
365 days a, week, uh, a year, we are on a war fighting organization persistently deployed around the globe. We operate above, on and below the water, in the littoral and on land. So in some ways it's a microcosm of all of UK defense. We're in the most extreme of environments and we're in multiple hybrid wars today. We don't necessarily know who we might have to fight tonight and tomorrow is even less certain. So what that makes change hard, you know, sunsets, sunrises, new technology, none of them are easy decisions. And ultimately at the base level, we both protect and have to take life on occasion. But we live in an ex exponential world and the threats are rising. So within the Navy, our transformation priorities are deterrent and the North Atlantic, the fifth generation global carrier strike, fifth generation global littoral strike and the commando force, global persistence and technology and innovation. We are embracing as an organization, agile, scrum, lean startup, problem led, fast learn and show not tell uh, approaches, learning by doing and a minimal viable product. Autonomy, open payload options that are agnostic, possibly powered by AI and iterating through those processes are fundamental. And then it comes on to where I'm starting to lean into in the accelerators through Nemesis, Nelson, Marworks and Navy X. So if I just sort of pass on a slightly busy slide, but what I think the vision for my role in this should be, and it's to be the Royal Navy's innovation engine, divine, defined by its problem and partnership led approach, a natural thought leader in innovation across defense and best in class for accelerating solutions into service. And therefore to the mission is to power edge innovation by delivering scalable disruptive solutions at speed and enabling the Royal Navy's global competitive advantage. The strategy to achieve that, I think, and I feel is to employ a repeatable and scalable process to maintain high tempo engagement with traditional and critically non-traditional stakeholders to identify scalable solutions to problems. We'll work in lockstep with the acquisition directorate, the other commands, the other elements of defense, DNS, and partners to canvas solutions through testing, experimentation, exploitation at a pace faster than our enemies can adapt. The value proposition that I see within this is rapidly prioritizing problems across the Navy to ensure the most pressing are quickly validated for a solution. We'll test, experiment, and then scale disruptive solutions at speed if necessary, and increase the rate of transition of solutions into the service. The images on screen at the bottom of that slide currently are some of the 30 plus projects my team is currently engaged with. I throw this up as a potential uh, option for consideration, but whether it's driven by an operational requirement, scouting by the office of the chief technology officer, academia or industry, drive to understand the requirements and deliver an output, be that a way of thinking, a concept, or even a capability of type that can be tested against a hypothesis, developed further, or fielded to prove its utility or otherwise. If successful, it can be handed off to a capability sponsor for scale and full integration. If it fails and we learn, then we move on, uh, but we've still undoubtedly reaped a benefit and a reward from the work we've conducted. Brigadier Matt has already covered some of the themes of the Battle Lab will initially focus on or be focused on. For me, counter UAS, autonomy, swarming, payloads and modularity are all up there. In July, we have Autonomous Advanced Force 4 exercise based from the Battle Lab being run by the Royal Marines and proving the network approach across the domains of air, land and sea. The heavy lift drone challenge should be hot on the heels of that in this similar area. By collaborating and harnessing the best of both defense and industry, we can surely drive efficiencies, but critically arrive at a suitable capability in a timely fashion. Slide please. A few more are a few further snapshots of work that is being done or is, is in progress within my team, but the problem sets uh, and the banners above them speak for themselves. For me, it's about technology acceleration, experimenting, accrediting where we need to and learning along that journey. It's collaborating with partners, it's consulting with new and exciting partners of whatever size, and there shouldn't be any bar to that. I throw this one up as an interesting challenge that is currently being run uh, very recently and it's contemporary by the Office of Chief Technology Officer within the Navy. The concept of modularized pods that can be deployed by a number of hosts 
and contain within a spectrum of effect. This is something that the Navy will be sprinting on over the next few months to determine the feasibility, utility, and the requirements or demand signals go with them. And so back to my purview, the cultural shift that's needed to really address the current problems, problem sets in our hands. My team is just one part of a broadening ecosystem and the Battle Lab is offering a focal point for elements of that around which to coalesce. The means come via the collaboration across area, across domain, across industry, and across command. Slide, please. And so back to the Battle Lab. With the access to the ranges, as Brigadier Matt alluded to, containing cleared airspace, a maritime flank, and a littoral environment, it becomes one of the very few places in the UK and potentially the world where collabor collaboration at this level can be harnessed. I'm investigating options for an extension of the Battle Lab down at Portland for a truly maritime facing annex. Uh, and there's ultimate flexibility within the air environment to come and join us on that journey. However, the bottom line is it's not about us, in my opinion, in terms of in defense, this is about industry. And so webinars and engagement like this and the very aspiration of the Battle Lab to be that focal point, to be that point around which we can all coalesce is the key part and the key element within this concept. And on that, I'll now hand over to Dr. Matt Brooks from DSTL. Matt. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, and just watching your presentation there, it is, it's, it's fascinating, isn't it? That you know, innovation can arise in many different shapes and forms. And I couldn't help uh, in seeing the, the presentation of the uh, modular, modularized uh, Navy pods. Think back to uh, Jerry Anderson in the 1960s and, of course, uh, Thunderbird 2. Um, so uh, innovation, uh, inspiration can arise from many different sources. So thank you for dialing into this uh, webinar. Uh, and I'm going to cover, um, if you'll forgive me, a, a, a really rather broad introduction to DSTL, hopefully give you a flavour uh, of what we do in DSTL. But what I'd really like to have uh, front and centre um, of my presentation today is collaboration. It's absolutely key to what DSTL does. And we see uh, the Battle Lab as a, an absolutely um, fantastic opportunity to energize uh, and turbocharge uh, the way in which we collaborate both with industry uh, and uh, with uh, the users of the S&T. Key to DSTL's strategy uh, going forward is something that we're calling first of its kind experimentation. And this is where uh, we can accelerate the development and uh, adoption of disruptive technology, bridge uh, what's sometimes referred to as the valley of death and get innovative concepts into the hands of users uh, and having uh, an operational effect. Uh, so just before I continue with my slides, uh, I'm uh, just going to uh, run a, a short video, which I hope will give you a, a broader flavour of uh, what DSTL does. So if we can run that now. DSTL scientific experts have a deep operational understanding of defence and security using a vast network and inside knowledge across government to deliver world-class science and technology. Our aim is to demystify and exploit science and technology for our customers so we can give them technical advantage and superior capability. So hopefully you will have seen there just right at the end uh, three values, I've repeated them here on this slide, and, and absolutely central to uh, our engagement going forward with the Battle Lab is that uh, concept uh, of collaboration. Um, so as you saw, uh, we're in the business of delivering high impact science and technology for the UK's defence, security and prosperity. And the image that you can see here is an image that appeared on Tom's slides as well, uh, is MAST, uh, the Maritime Autonomy Surface Testbed, 
uh, which is a, a, a multi-organization collaboration, so DSTL, L3 Harris, and others looking at the future um, of autonomous uh, uh, maritime surface vessels. And an example of the kind of technology uh, that we will be looking to take forward in, a, in the sort of collaborative environment that uh, the Battle Lab will provide. So really what I want, uh, the, the, the key thing I want you to take from this slide here is, is the, the, the middle bullet on the left. So 335 million pounds spend with industry. So um, pretty much half of DSGL's turnover uh, is spent with suppliers in both industry uh, and academia. We cannot deliver uh, the S&T that we do and, and have the impact that we do without working uh, with partners uh, in industry and academia. So uh, anything that enables us to work more closely with those partners and anything that enables our uh, industrial partners to uh, get closer to the mindset of our uh, military customers uh, is, uh, is really going to uh, empower um, the delivery of uh, the s and and that's exactly the sort of opportunity that we believe the Battle Lab uh, presents to us. Uh, so as you can see, uh, DSTL funding uh, doesn't just come from uh, uh, the MOD. Um, uh, this slide uh, maybe has got slightly mangled, um, but uh, significant contribution, uh, by far the lion's share uh, from uh, what we call the uh, Chief Scientific Advisor s and Programme, so that's uh, MOD's non-nuclear uh, s and research, but also significant uh, amounts from uh, wider government, also from frontline commands um, and defence uh, equipment uh, and support. So the sort of work that we'll be doing is going to be not just defence focused, but cross governments focused and, and really tying into the uh, NSTIX uh, concept that Brigadier Matt uh, presented in his slides. So as you can see uh, here, just a small selection of, uh, of the uh, industry that we work with, um, a lot of primes here. Um, but we are equally keen to work with small and medium sized enterprises um, and that in terms of tapping into the innovation that exists in small companies uh, and even in sole traders is uh, is vital to uh, to DSTL. Similarly uh, with academia uh, a lot of work particularly at the low TRL levels exploring uh, broader concepts uh, we do uh, out uh, in universities and of course universities themselves have a deep interest in uh, spinning out their technologies and so there's a, a, a significant amount of engagement uh, with spin outs from universities and how uh, we're able to uh, or how we can help them exploit the IP that is uh, generated through work that DSTL funds. DSTL works globally so there are uh, international collaborative opportunities um, and as you can see uh, second only to the US in terms of uh, five collaboration that's between uh, US, UK, Canada, Australia uh, and New Zealand. These are the products and services that DSTL offers. Uh, research accounts for nearly half of that and that's really uh, where we'll be uh, focusing our activities in the battle lab, um, although aspects of requirements and evaluation are important as well. Um, in terms of what DSTL does, uh, 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 synonymous perhaps in the media with, uh, with Port and Down uh, and uh, chemical and biological uh, defence research and of course DSTL played a huge role uh, in the Salisbury Novichok response but you may have seen uh, on uh, the national news in October when Her Majesty the Queen came to open a brand new energetics analysis centre at uh, Port and Down uh, where uh, our forensic explosives laboratory operates from and this uh, provides uh, support to the UK criminal justice system uh, for the criminal and terrorist use of explosives anywhere on uh, the Great Britain, uh, Great Britain mainland. Uh, we supported F-35 into, into service and there is significant research going on as you would expect into uh, cyber and quantum. Um, and I think a key point that I want to make in terms of IP uh, intellectual property, which I'll come back to again, is that uh, we will uh, seek uh, that the, the IP for uh, work that we fund will in most cases vest with the uh, company or the university carrying out the research. So MOD will have user rights, but really it will be up to the company to exploit that IP. Um, where DSTL itself generates IP, then obviously that's something that we're keen to exploit. But in terms of our collaborative work, uh, the IP uh, uh, in, from, in most cases will vest with the uh, company uh, carrying out the work. So uh, DSTL uh, defines the S&T that it does in terms of these uh, strategic 
capabilities um, and you can see it, it effectively covers the breadth of, uh, of uh, military systems, um, technological systems um, and in terms of how uh, and what we're going to collaborate on uh, in the battle lab, um, I think pretty much uh, everything is on the table here, uh, with the possible sole exception of, of CBR, where, where clearly uh, we have very specialist facilities uh, at Port and Down. Um, but uh, nothing is off the table. Um, we see the battle lab as a, as a tremendous opportunity uh, in all of these areas, particularly with its links to uh, the Low Earth uh, training estate. I just want to very briefly bring to your attention, if you're not already aware, of uh, something called R Cloud. Um, uh, this is a very simple means through which uh, uh, DSTL can contract with you effectively. Um, uh, uh, allowing you to uh, sign up um, and define the capabilities you have against those strategic capabilities uh, and uh, contracting opportunities uh, will be uh, available to you as a registered uh, uh, member of our cloud. So um, I won't say any more about it. You can uh, uh, read the bullets there. And if you Google DSTL R cloud, um, you'll be directed in terms of how to do that. Um, I would just reiterate that the IP rights uh, will reside solely with you as the supplier. Uh, DSTL and MOD will have uh, will have full user rights, but um, this is a, a, a real opportunity for uh, owning and, and exploiting uh, IP um, for the benefit of both defence but also wider uh, UK uh, prosperity. So I really just wanted to come back to these strategic capabilities. Your organisation, your company. Um, uh, may work in, in one or more of these. Um, and uh, if, if you do, then I think there will be opportunities for you uh, at uh, the Battle Lab um, working uh, with DSTL. So uh, we see it as an opportunity for um, existing contracts, uh, the, the, uh, formal contracts, but I think more importantly than that, we see it as uh, an opportunity to interact at an informal level with uh, a broader s and uh, ecosystem. Um, to that end, uh, we're working on a, a, a pan-defense approach to how we uh, manage um, IP considerations at that informal level of collaboration so that um, those sort of uh, coffee machine uh, discussions, I think a key aspect and benefit of the Battle Lab is that um, very often we won't actually know what um, we want to be collaborating on um, until we start having those conversations in the Innovation Centre, um, meeting uh, the different companies uh, that are, uh, are participating in that and developing um, um, opportunities and concepts through those discussions, through that co-location of uh, military users, uh, DSTL with its broad view of defence science and uh, technology, uh, and you, uh, with your particular uh, uh, subject matter expertise and your particular offer. Um, DSTL is working to establish um, uh, collaborative hubs uh, across the UK and uh, we see the Defence Battle Lab as an absolutely key hub uh, for us. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and thank you very much. It's, uh, that, was, that was excellent. Thanks very much. No, I'm really, uh, I'm just the window dressing here to, to, to do a link piece. Uh, before I hand over to the main event. So uh, the Battle Lab, uh, you know, rightly the outputs are capability, military capability focused, otherwise it wouldn't be the Army and Defence Battle Lab. Um, and over time we see those outputs stretching to defence, uh, sorry, beyond defence into government and, and indeed there's, there's interest there as, as we speak. So if those are the sort of the key outputs, the key inputs clearly come from industry, from yourselves, uh, as we as we want to drive this through. But the wider government is, is so important to us, both in supporting UK industry uh, and the regions, but specifically um, the local council, Dorset Council. This couldn't have taken place without the fantastic vision, ambition and work of Dorset Council uh, and, oh, and indeed the Dorset Local Enterprise Partnership. Uh, and that's why I'm so delighted to be able to introduce now John Selgren, the executive, executive director of Place from Dorset Council whose personal commitment uh, to this project has been uh, instrumental in enabling the Battle Lab to get off the ground. Uh, as we said, it's something new and novel, uh, and I'm sure uh, many of the people listening can either imagine or, or experience themselves of, of working in government and defence, that putting something together that's cross-government, cross-defence, uh, cross-local councils with different funding streams, different rules and regulations, uh, has been no easy matter. 
Uh, and it's due to the energy and thought and, and uh, say, commitment of people like John that this has been able to take place. So I'm delighted to be able to introduce now uh, John Selgren. John. Thank you, Brigadier Matt, for that very warm welcome and good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you on this important event this afternoon. So the Dorset uh, Innovation Park site at Winfrith that we've been looking at where the Battle Lab is currently located, and you saw that on the slides earlier from Brigadier Matt uh, coming out of the ground. That build took place, it began on the 4th of January this year and was completed by the end of April. So uh, a four month uh, start to, to build completion for that first phase. So it's on time and to budget. As Brigadier Matt says, we've now got a strong drive towards getting the second stage and the offices completed, which we'll do into the autumn. And again, I'm hoping that will be on time. Um, the site itself is in the ownership of Dorset Council. It extends to 56 hectares. It's a former nuclear test site and therefore has a long history of being um, a quite secure site with, within Dorset and therefore is important, has always been important from a strategic point of view. And it's really good to see that uh, the Battle Lab is moving on to the site to really take forward that concept of an enterprise zone. And whilst it's perhaps true to say that enterprise zones are not necessarily at the top of the government's uh, priority list, as Brigadier Matz in his introductory comments, it's very important to those who are on this call who may be interested in relocating to the site that uh, at present that, that enterprise zone designation carries a number of important tax breaks, which do perhaps provide further incentive, if indeed being co-located by our MOD colleagues is not enough in itself, uh, that will help you um, to, to uh, come to the site uh, and to bring your business to the location. And that enterprise zone went live in April 2017 and continues to run. I think the other important thing from the point of view of those who, of you who'd like to invest in the site uh, is that it is subject to a local development order. I understand that those of you who may not be close to the inner workings of the planning system, what that means in, in simple terms is there's a simplified planning regime in place, which means that we can fast track applications for new builds on the site. And indeed, as the applicant ourselves, as Dorset Council, uh, to, to build the Battle Lab, uh, we also went through that process. So I'm able to testify to the fact that that process works uh, smoothly and effectively. One of the things was done, I'll come on in the next slide to, to talk a bit more about that, is that there was a very clear uh, sense when the battle, uh, when the uh, enterprise zone was launched and the Dorset Innovation Park created, that uh, a master plan was developed as part of that local development order. And that in particular specified not only the nature and character of the buildings that would take place on the site, but also even at that early stage to emphasize the sectoral focus which the site would have. And that focus is around advanced engineering and manufacturing, of defense, of marine, of the energy sector, and of cybersecurity. And a number of those um, business names, uh, high profile business names that were on uh, Matt Brooks's slide earlier are already tenants on the Dorset Innovation Park site. And again, therefore, what the, uh, the Battle Lab coming to this site represents is an opportunity to re-seize and take forward the drive towards building out that site with the focus on those sectors that I've named. So we as a council have a very clear plan for moving forward and we've done that jointly, as Brigadier Matt said, in conjunction uh, with the Dorset uh, Local Enterprise Partnership, the LEP, which has been the key part of enabling us to develop the site and the, and the aspiration to use the Dorset Innovation Park to drive economic development within the county of Dorset. We've recently had leading consultants have a look at that plan just to make sure it's uh, tested robustly and to make sure that our own internal thinking bears out against the, the wider market considerations and the current state of the defence and security economy. What that consultant said to us loud and clear was to endorse the fact that we have a number of local businesses already located on that site. The site has a strong tradition for local businesses seeking to expand in the sectors that I've referred to on the Dorset Innovation uh, site at Winfrith. And that reflects the nature of the Dorset economy. The Dorset economy, for those that know it, and indeed for those, those that don't, isn't one that is dominated by any one single sector. And that does make it stand out uh, in national terms. The other thing that we know about the Dorset economy, and that's very relevant to the conversation that we're having this afternoon, and the aspirations that our colleagues uh, in the MOD have for, for driving the supply chain within the defence and security sector through this investment, is that we have a very closely integrated supply chain arrangement within Dorset with a lot of very, very close linkages between companies that are also located in Dorset. So again, that points to a, 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 an economy that is already familiar with the notion of the very close supply chain linkages 
that we, that we aspire to drive further through the investment of the battle lab. In terms of the wider things, and particularly in terms of the significance of the battle lab itself and what we anticipate that will bring, we think and, and have had a firm that's likely to bring two things. This is what we're going to be driving forward in the, in the months that lie ahead. Looking for companies that actually want to grow their premises, having been tenants in the battle lab. And I'll talk in the next slide about how that uh, will come to pass. So we think that a number of people will uh, be working with the MOD at the battle lab. And the result of that, we'll be looking to grow their businesses and as a result, seek to take sites uh, on, the, on the business park to develop their own facilities. The other one is that we think there are companies, and we see a lot of this already, two of our most recent investments onto the innovation park have been of this type. These are people who are already working in supply chain linkage to other Dorset Innovation Park tenants. And again, want to further grow their investment on the site to be proximate to that supply chain. And also now with the arrival of the Battle Lab, the MOD facilities as well. So just in summary then, the focus is strongly on the defense uh, and, in, and uh, intelligence cluster. And I think that reinforces the point that Brigadier Matt made in his introductory comments about the significance of the defense and security industrial strategy. And indeed, if you've not had a chance to look at that document in detail, I would encourage you to do so. And in particular, to reference the fact that the uh, Battle Lab is identified as a case study of innovation of the kind that the uh, government is seeking as part of this next stage of defense innovation. So in terms of taking space uh, in the uh, innovation park, in, in the innovation park itself, and particularly at the Battle Lab, uh, so as this is a facility that is run by uh, the council, if, you are, if you're interested in taking a site uh, on, the, on the park, then do make contact through um, Joanna Rufus or through the website that's shown on this particular slide. In terms of occupancy at the Battle Lab, uh, again, I think to recognize that we're very much cutting new ground with this, but the early research that we have done with MOD colleagues, indeed with, uh, with industry experts, suggests that we might expect three particular types of tenant, and therefore we are setting tenancy arrangements which support these characteristics of working. The first is what we, we, we are simply calling the day rate, those who want to try the facility and perhaps spend a day or two on the site working with MOD colleagues and others uh, at the Battle Lab to see whether this is something that they want to, to take on and, and develop a relationship with. The second one is a project rate, and these are people that we think are likely to be collaborating with the MOD on the kinds of projects that you've heard described earlier in this uh, presentation. And we think that typically those occupancy rates will be between three and nine months. And then for those who have a longer term relationship, there will be an annual rate that is payable to enable those who want to have a longer tenure at the Battle Lab to do just that. I'll now hand back to uh, Brigadier Matt because that ends uh, my part of the presentation. Thank you for listening. Hey, thanks, John. Uh, that's that's brilliant. Thank you very much. And um, this is the slide I was talking about uh, earlier on when I said that the details, contact details will be at the bottom and the QR code uh, is on there. Um, so we finished, I think, on time, if not two minutes early. Uh, we thought we'd spend sort of 15 minutes asking, answering your questions, uh, give 15 minutes of people's time back. And I uh, suspect that people are getting a little bit Zoom tired after over a year of it. Uh, but we're really grateful that um, that you've both joined us and that you've hung around. Numbers are great. So thank you very much for that. And so um, Richard has kindly agreed to sort of uh, shepherd our questions for us and then we'll take them as a panel and, and direct them around a bit. Richard. Thank you very much, Matt. 